Hello, how's everybody doing today? This is Rich Harshaw, and we are here today for our webinar. Now, typically this would be an innovation hour, but given our new schedule for 2013, each month I substitute one of our core calls, which is our strategic marketing, tactical marketing, and innovation call, for a different type of call, uh, one of those being a personal edge call. Uh, and this is a series that I did with regularity about three or four years ago. I think it was 2009. <laughs> Covered several topics, but uh, in the intervening few years, there's been a few other things that have come up that I've found interesting enough to talk about on a webinar. So if you're on this webinar today, I guess you're here because um, it's a topic you're interested in. So we're going to go ahead and jump in. And uh, <laughs> I want to talk about um, a topic called halftime and definite chief aim. Now let's get into a couple of definitions and uh, this will start to come together for you a little bit. I read a book uh, about two years ago called halftime by a guy named Bob Buford and a lot of the concepts in there were very similar to a book I had read many times called the law of success by Napoleon Hill and a concept that he has called definite chief aim. And uh, this is what we're going to talk about today. It has to do with, with uh, in your life, creating a quest for significance instead of just a quest for success. So let me start out by giving you some definitions. Uh, before they do that, I'm going to give you an idea of where we're going with this so you can kind of get a, uh, a mental map of what I'm going to talk about. The first thing I'm going to talk about is just the definition of what is first half, second half, and halftime. Uh, then we're going to talk about some triggers for halftime, things that happen in your life potentially that makes you start to think about the transition from first half to second half. And then we're going to talk about definite chief aim, creating one, how, what it is, and some examples of some. And then we're going to go through a drill of some questions that I want you to ask yourself and hopefully write down that will give you an idea of how you can develop this definite chief aim for the second half of your life. And then uh, the last thing we're going to talk about is, is uh, those of you who are in business, which is the majority of you on this, this, uh, in our insider program, how you can uh, actually make this happen and still toggle your business. So that's what we're going to talk about today. So let's get into a definition first, the first half of your life. And this is according to uh, Bob Buford in the book. And, uh, you don't necessarily have to pick up this book. I think it's a good book, and uh, if you wanted to read it, I, I certainly wouldn't discourage it. Just a couple of disclaimers. It's written from a Christian perspective. A few of the things that I might say uh, might have some of that Christian perspective in it, uh, but I don't really want to take it from a Christian perspective as much as I do just a life perspective. So uh, that's one of the things you need to look at. The definite chief aim discussion from Laws of Success doesn't have anything to do with the Christian perspective. And so that may be uh, a little more palatable for you. It just depends on your background and what you're interested in. Okay. So you may want to get this book. You may not want to get this book, but uh, I'm going to cover some of the main themes from it. Okay. So here's what he says, the first half of life. And I'm just going to read a couple passages from the book. I'm not going to read uh, at length from the book during this, this call, but I will read a few passages. He says in the first half of life, there's barely enough time to go, uh, beyond what he calls second base in life, uh, which is the path to significance. We are hunter-gatherers, doing our best to provide for our families, to advance our careers, and to pass our beliefs and values on to our children. In addition, for most men, and certainly a growing number of women, the first half finds us in warrior mode. We need to pr prove to ourselves and others that we can accomplish something big, and the best way to do that is to become increasingly focused and intense. The first half of life has to do with achieving and gaining, learning and earning. The majority do this in the most ordinary of ways, getting an education, entering the workforce, starting a family, buying a house, earning enough money to provide for needs as well as new, a few wants, setting goals, climbing towards those goals. Some chase the prize in a more spectacular, aggressive fashion, closing major deals, winning a big case, acquiring through leveraged buyouts and mergers, doing whatever it takes to make it to the top. If we have any spiritual interest, they usually take 
their form in typical first half fashion, serving on the church building committee, teaching a Sunday school class, organizing the annual stewardship campaign. Okay, so this is first half. It's basically all about getting ahead, trying to succeed. And I, I want to make the, the point here of what he's saying is that this isn't stuff that is bad. It's stuff that's normal. You get a house, you have a mortgage, you have kids, you've got to deal with that. Maybe it's overwhelming. I've got six kids. I'm here to tell you. Half the time, it's overwhelming. But here's what we're going to talk about. It's the concept of halftime, which is a period of your life. It's not dictated by age. It's dictated realistically more by maturity than anything else. When you get to a point of your life where you say, you know what, maybe there's something more. And we're going to talk about some triggers here in just a minute. But let's talk about what the second half is. The second half is riskier. It has to do with living beyond the immediate. It's about releasing the seed of creativity and energy that has been implanted with, within us, watering and cultivating it so we may be abundantly fruitful. It involves investing our gifts in service to others and receiving the personal joy that comes as a result of that spending. For the second half of life to be better than the first, you must make the choice to step outside of the safety of living on autopilot. You have to wrestle with who you are, why you believe what you profess to believe about your life, and what you do to provide meaning and structure to your daily activities and relationships. So we want to talk about this transition. Now, if you're the kind of person that's already firmly entrenched in quote unquote the second half and you are actively working towards bigger, better, more altruistic things, then congratulations, that's fantastic. <laughs> but I want to talk to the rest of us, people who are maybe maybe still in the first half or either approaching or somewhere in the middle of this halftime where these bigger significance type questions are starting to weigh a little bit or maybe a lot. And you're trying to find out a couple of things. Number one, what that bigger purpose is, or what we're going to talk about in a second, definite chief aim might be. Uh, number two, um, how can you actually make that transition given the fact that we've got all these things going on in our life? Okay. Now, let me give you a quote about being busy. And I'll, I apologize ahead of time because I cut off who the quote was from. I'll have to find it later. Here's what it says. The feeling of being hurried is not usually the result of living a full life and having no time. It is, on the contrary, born of, a, born of a vague fear that we are wasting our life. When we do not do the one thing we ought to do, we have no time for anything else. We are the busiest people in the world. Okay? So here's what we're trying to do. We're trying to shift from the first half success to the second half significance. Now, let's talk about triggers for just a minute. In the book, Bob Buford, the guy that wrote the book, tells his story about how he was a successful cable television operator. To what extent he was successful, I'm not 100% sure, but I know this. He made a lot of money. He was very successful, but he kind of had that feeling that many of us have, which is, you know, is there more than just earning this money? Well, here's what triggered his epiphany. It was the death of his son. His son was a teenager late in his teens, I believe he was uh, around 20, somewhere in that neighborhood, and uh, there was an accident while he was on an, uh, sort of a hiking trip in southern Texas, and uh, they didn't recover his body. He was, uh, he was drowned, and I think uh, some amount of time later, there was a time when he was missing, and then they, they recovered him, and it was, of course, devastating, and it really got this guy, Bob, to thinking, well, you know, I've got all this money, I've got all this success, but the one thing in my life that uh, really is my treasure, which is my son, and he has a good marriage too, but his son is now missing. Now, I want to bring up another book, an interesting book. I read this book last year on a recommendation that I saw in Running Magazine, and they were interviewing a guy who was an African champion runner, and they asked him, what's your favorite book? And he said, Jansen's Gift. I want to tell you about this book for a second. It's called Jansen's Gift. I'm not even sure I know how to spell that. Let me look it up. Let's see. J-A-N-T-S-E-N. -E Jansen's Gift. Okay. Jansen's Gift. Now, it's an interesting book. It is a very similar story 
to Bob Buford's in a lot of ways. It's about a woman named Pam Cope. It's her, it's a sort of a biography or memoir. And she had a very similar situation. Her, she was living her life. Things were doing fine. She had her own hair salon. She had a husband that was successful. They weren't what you'd call super duper rich, but they were doing fine. They had a nice house. They had cars. They had food. They had, you know, all the niceties of life. You can understand who this person is. They're probably a lot like you, okay? And then she had a similar experience as Bob Buford, which is her son, who was 15 at the time, had a heart problem that they did not know about, and he suddenly died one day just out of the blue. They had no idea he even had a problem. Uh, he started feeling pains in his chest and went into some kind of a, I don't know if it was a seizure or whatnot, but they rushed him to the hospital, and unfortunately he died immediately. He didn't even make it. And she became devastated. It was a very interesting story. This is one of those rare books that when you start reading it, you find it extremely difficult to put down. It's depressing and inspiring all at the same time. It goes into a great amount of detail about what happened after her son died and how she went into a very, very deep depression to the extent that her daughter, she had two kids, her daughter, who was 11, had to basically take care of her because she could not really function. And uh, the book is called Jansen's Gift because here's what happened. When her son died, they, they put a request to people that instead of sending flowers to his funeral, et cetera, that people would simply make a donation in his name, and then they would donate the money to a charity. Well, after about a year, she was depressed. She hadn't even thought about the charity, and her husband said, you know, we really ought to do something with this money. And she said, well, how much money is it? She had never even stopped to think about it. And he said, well, it's about $25,000. And she said, okay, well, maybe I can do something positive with this money that would honor the memory of her son. Now, at the time, she was still extraordinarily depressed in a very, very dark place. So she started thinking, well, maybe if I can find something to do with this money, it will at least give me something to occupy my time. It's related to my son. This will honor him. So she started looking. Now, I'm going to tell you what she did, but not quite yet. I want to just point out right now that this was her trigger that got her thinking about, you know what, maybe there's more that I could be doing. And I'm going to tell you right now, st stay tuned on this call because I'm going to tell you what she did a little bit later. And it, it is extraordinary, just absolutely extraordinary. But there's this trigger. It was her son's death. Now, I had a trigger in my life. It was about 10 years ago in 2003. Uh, I was a young man. I was about 20, excuse me, 34 years old. Uh, made a lot of money. In 2002, I made, you know, let's just say it was a lot of money. I had a lot of money. We, our business was doing good. But there was a lot of cracks in the foundation of the business that were not necessarily readily apparent. And from the time 2003, middle of 2003 to the middle of 2004, about a year's period of time, that foundation started to crumble. Lots of things started to go, go wrong. We went from a company that was doing about $23 million in sales. We had about 90 or 95 employees, and it all caved in, all of it. We went from 95 employees to six employees in about a year. We went from $23 million in sales to less than a million dollars of sales in about a year. Well, here's the problem with that story. On top of just, hey, the business crashed, the interesting thing about that is when your business starts to crash, you, you really it, – it's hard to know what to do, especially if it's never happened before, and especially if you were the kind of person who was naive and young and dumb enough to build a business with enough cracks in the foundation that it could all completely crumble and fail – so what happened is I ended up piling a bunch of my own personal money that I had made in the last several years back into the business to the extent that I had no more money, and I had to go out and borrow money to put into the business, and that money went away. And I looked up a year later, and not only was I not doing well financially, I was in the hole by seven figures multiplied a couple of times over. 
And I looked up and I went, holy crap, what just happened here? And, and I'm going to tell you, it's a humbling experience and it's an interesting experience, but I'll tell you what it is most of all. It's an experience that makes you examine your priorities and say to yourself, is there more to this life than just trying to get ahead and make money? I used to have this interesting little philosophy that in hindsight really was quite stupid. In the hindsight, the uh, the uh, hindsight uh, philosophy, the philosophy at the time was this. I'm going to work extraordinarily hard. I'm going to put in the hours. I'm going to do what it takes. I'm going to make a lot of money, and then I'm going to have enough money to do whatever I want. Because th these concepts of second half and definite chief aim, I already knew them. I'd already studied them in my 20s. I had this grand plan for what I wanted to do with my life, and it required a lot of money, and I was going to take these earnings, and I was going to do all these fantastic things with them. And God has a way of putting you in your place. And one of those ways is he takes your stuff, right? I mean, it happened to Job. I'm not saying I'm Job, by, not by any stretch of the imagination. My family is healthy. My wife is still with me. I still have a house. But I'm telling you, it was hard and it was painful. Here's what it is. It's called a trigger. And I remember one experience in particular that was very humbling, but at the same time it was very liberating. I'm not a car guy. I'm not the kind of guy that, that loves all kinds of big, fancy, expensive cars. But at that time, because I had enough money, I had a Corvette and I had a Hummer H2. And this is back when Hummer H2s were pretty new and they were pretty cool. And this is before everybody thought that they were just ruining the planet. Some people thought they were ruining the planet, but it was pretty cool. And I had these cars, and as the business started to crumble, they started to go away, and I uh, gave my Corvette back to the bank, and that was a problem. And I remember this one day, a guy came over, and he drove my Hummer off, and my wife started crying. And she wasn't crying because she liked the Hummer. She, she didn't really like that car. It's kind of a stupid car. If you drive one, I'm sorry, but it's kind of a stupid car. She cried because it represented that, you know what, we're, we're losing everything. And I remember seeing her cry and feeling sympathy or, I guess, empathy for her. But at the same time, it was very liberating that this thing called this car, which was gaudy and represented things that had been important to me, was being involuntarily hauled off. And it was very liberating. Now, you know, let me just quickly add, I had built a nice big house that I didn't lose. I still live in it. It's a nice house. So it's not like I went through this total ringer. But I'm telling you, when you go from being a millionaire to being in the hole by a few million, it's very humbling. And, yes, it is possible to keep your house as you go through that. Now, the good news is it's 10 years later, and things have bounced back real nicely. And, and the reason is because – this transformation, it starts to change you. Now, here's what I want to ask you. That's my story, and you know, maybe it's a little interesting to you. Maybe you're tired of hearing about it, whatever. But here's what I want to ask you. Can you make this transition from first half to second half? Do you need some kind of trigger? Because here's what we don't want to have happen. We don't want your son to die like in Bob Buford and Pam Cope's stories. You don't want to have to have your business crash. But if it takes those kind of experiences, count yourself as grateful and lucky. Not lucky and grateful that your son passed. That's ob obviously it's awful. But in both of their stories, and I can tell you with my story, which is obviously far less significant to lose a lot of money than it is to lose a child. I'm not trying to compare those things. I'm just telling you that they are both traumatic, okay? <laughs> so hopefully we can all understand that. But if you can count yourself lucky, if you can transform without those things, but even if it takes a dramatic, devastating trigger, count yourself as lucky because you know what? Here's the truth. There are tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of people out there that never fight through it, and they stay stuck in the first half for their whole life. They get older, and the quest for success never transitions into a quest for significance and the major life questions of what am I here for? What am I really trying to do? What's important? They don't really ever get addressed, let alone answered. Okay. 
So let's talk about the definite chief aim. Definite chief aim is a concept that I pulled from Napoleon Hill from the book, The Law of Success. <laughs> very interesting book, very long book, written a long time ago. So some of the, some of the language is archaic. It's kind of a weird book. Napoleon Hill is part weird, part genius. You kind of have to wade through that as you read the book. But it's an interesting concept. It's called definite chief aim. And I'm, gonna, I'm going to uh, tell you a quick little anecdote to, to illustrate this. I have a friend that's very successful in business. Uh, I met him through business. He's a client of mine for a period of time. And uh, partly because of the help that I gave him in business, but overwhelmingly because of just how awesome he is at business, business has succeeded beyond most people's wildest dreams. Now, he's not Bill Gates, and he's not uh, a super billionaire, but I don't know what the guy's net worth is. I, if I had to guess what this guy's net worth is, I would say it's probably $50 million. Or, in other words, enough money that he doesn't have to really worry about money or think about money. And I remember having a conversation with him. This was years ago. good friend of mine. I really like this guy. He's just a salt-of-the-earth nice guy. And he spends a lot of time with his kids. He's got kids, and he's, you know, he's a good guy. He does things, uh, you know, for the community, so forth. But he's he's very dedicated to his business. He gets the most satisfaction and joy out of running his business. And I asked him. I said, "So what are you trying to accomplish? You know, you're a successful guy. You could quit today if you wanted to. I'm not saying you have to, or it's, it's a bad thing to work. I'm just saying you could. What do you want to do with your life?" And he looked at me and he said, "What do you mean?" I said, well, is there, a, is there something that is unique to your gifts, a singular unique purpose that you are on this planet for that nobody else can accomplish that is unique to you? Is there something out there that you could do to benefit humanity or somebody or a, anything? It doesn't have to be solving world hunger. Is there anything out there? And he said, you know, I, I haven't really ever thought about that. I don't really know. And I thought, wow, that's, that's a little bit sad. It's a little bit sad. Remember, uh, I was at the Mavericks game last night. I uh, went with my son to the Dallas Mavericks game. And we're looking across the court, and there's this guy that sits over there on the, on the front row of the Mavericks game. He goes to pretty much every home game. He's a season ticket holder. And he's known – informally as the crazy Mavericks fan. He's this guy that wears freaky, crazy, outlandish clothes. Last night he had on bright orange jeans with bright orange cowboy boots with a shirt that was white with every color imaginable pattern on it. He's got silver hair pulled into a tight ponytail that's about a foot and a half long he was wearing matching orange glasses and had all kinds of jewelry. This guy is just he's, – he's well known as being a super Mavericks fan. And I've seen this guy a hundred times, and I was sitting there last night, and it was a commercial break or, you know, what, halftime or something. And I looked up on my phone, who is this guy? And I found a little bio about him and a little interview with him. And he's this guy that's rich who enjoys skiing, collecting cars, and being a super Mavericks fan. And I'm not here to say this guy is a loser because he's not. I'm not here to say that he's got no meaning in life because I don't know him, and I'm sure he does. But I thought, wow, this is very interesting that this guy, according to his interview, okay, I, I didn't just read about him. I read an interview with him, okay? So it gave you a little bit of depth into who he is, and he loves to ride motorcycles. He loves to buy and have cars, he loves skiing, and he loves the Dallas Mavericks. Now, none of those things in and of themselves are bad things. In fact, he says he does two motorcycle rides every year across the country for charity with these groups that do these charity. One of them is a Paul Newman's charity, and the other one is uh, some other famous person's charity, and they ride across the, the country, and they raise money. One, I believe, is for unplanned teenage pregnancies, helping mothers, and one was for some other uh, kind of childhood disease. I can't remember exactly. But these are all worthy things, but I thought it, it, it seems that those things are good. I, again, I'm not trying to be judgmental. I'm just looking at the saying, is there more than that, that somebody of that type of wealth, 
and power could potentially be doing. And again, if he is doing those things, you know, more power to him. But it just it, don't you ask yourself these questions? Here's what the de- definite chief aim is. The singular unique purpose for you on this big blue marble, something that you were put here to do, that you with your gifts, your talents, your energies, your understandings, your strengths, you've got a position to do. Okay? I remember uh, hearing a story about somebody that made a life mission out of a trigger. And I want to tell you who it was. This was a person who had a sister that had breast cancer and unfortunately uh, after about a year battle very painful very uh, uncomfortable the her sister died of breast cancer and she was devastated of course her sister had died and they were not old they were in their 30s at the time the, the woman who had died had a family small kids had a husband and the woman asked herself we live in america We live in the most medically advanced country in the history of the world, and yet we can't figure out how to keep my sister from dying of breast cancer. And she got mad, not mad at the doctors, not mad at the world. She just got mad in general, and she said, you know what? I'm going to do something about this, and she dedicated her life. She dedicated her wealth. She dedicated her everything. She started a foundation called the Susan G. Komen Breast Cancer Foundation. Now, here's who this woman is. I don't know if you know who started the Susan G. Komen Breast Cancer Foundation. Her name is Nancy Brinker. And her husband, he's uh, since deceased, is named Norman Brinker of uh, Chili's Restaurant fame. She was the wife of the man who started Chili's, and I'm sure she had a lot to do with that as well, but she took this opportunity to dedicate her life to something. Now, I want to look at this for a second. I don't think that everybody on this call, certainly not even me on this call, I'm not trying to say I'm different or better or have any greater purpose or plan than you do, but she had an interesting scenario. She's been able to affect millions and millions of people. Now, breast cancer has not been cured yet, but let's look at it this way. What if, let's just say hypothetically, right now it's 2013, let's say that breast cancer gets cured in the year 2020. In other words, they find a cure for it and they find a way to prevent it or to at least uh, uh, get rid of it if it does manifest itself. Let's say it's 2020. And this foundation has been going since, I believe, gosh, maybe uh, 1990-ish, maybe a little earlier than that, maybe a little later. Let's just call it roughly 1990. That'll be roughly 30 to 30-something years. And they've raised billions of dollars. They've put it into research. They do the Komen run for the cure and all those things. You've probably heard of them. But here's the question. If indeed, this is hypothetical. I understand that. So go with me on this. If indeed breast cancer is cured in the year 2020, Moving forward from 2020 on, how many families' lives will be positively affected for the work that this singular woman decided to put into her definite chief aim in life? I don't know what the statistics are. I haven't looked them up. I probably should have looked them up in preparation for this call. But what if the number of women saved was tens or hundreds of thousands per year? Now, it's not just the women that were saved it's the people that they would have left behind had they not been saved. And this is an interesting concept. So think about this for a minute. Now, I'm going to go back and tell you about Pam Cope. Okay. This is the one from the book, Jansen's gift, whose 15 year old son died and she went into a deep depression. If you remember, I told you that she had uh, a fund set up that she uh, was able to collect $25,000 and she decided that she would do something in honor of her son. Now, I'm going to read you the introduction of this book, okay? And then I'm going to go and do a little backtracking. This will take you just a few minutes. I'm going to tell you your story. I find it very interesting. You might not, but uh, that's your prerogative to do now, I guess, if you don't like it. So here's the introduction of the book, and it's going to kind of set the stage for who she is and what she did. She says, in late October 2006, I was sitting on a bed in a Hilton hotel high above Times Square. My husband, Randy, and I had decided to take a last-minute vacation in New York City to see Mamma Mia with our friends. It had been a great weekend filled with long meals, lazy naps, and one annoying show tune that I could not get out of my head. That Sunday morning, Randy had gone out for a walk. 
and as I rested my book on my lap and watched the cream form volcano clouds in my coffee, I drank in the stillness of the room. With two eight-year-old children at home, quiet, undisturbed moments like this were far too rare. But in the tranquility I felt at that moment was about to be shattered by Randy as he rushed through the door holding a copy of the New York Times. Put that book down, he said. You've got to read this. As I took the paper from him, I saw the photograph on the front page. Remember, this is the New York Times. A tiny African boy standing in the shadows of what looked like a mud hut. He wore an adult-sized T-shirt printed with an image of the Little Mermaid. The shirt swallowed him whole. The collar was so worn and so stressed it hung down near his navel, revealing the bones in his chest and scars on his skin. Its hem nearly touched the floor, making it appear as if he were wearing a dress, but it was the haunted look in his eyes that truly seized me. I took my time and I read the article slowly. When I finished, I got up from the bed and walked to the window, which glowed orange and pink from the lights of Times Square. A soft rain was falling outside. I watched the thousands of people milling about in the dark umbrellas, dozens of stories below me. Mark Quan Quadwo was the boy in the photograph. He was a six-year-old slave. He lived in, the, in Ghana, West Africa. And his parents had sold him to a man who fished at Lake Volta, the country's largest lake. He was forced to work on the lake 14 hours a day, seven days a week, besides, beside hundreds of other boys just like him. His typical day began at 5 a.m. when the man called Master woke him by hitting him with a branch torn from a nearby tree, then wrapped him in a thin bed sheet to keep him warm. He hiked barefoot in the darkness to the cold waters of the lake, climbed into a canoe, and helped paddle the paddle to the nets that had been laid the previous evening. The older slave children on his boat, stripped naked to make their work easier, dove in to pull the catch while Mark used a sawed-off con cooking container to scoop out the water that slowly pooled on the floor of the leaky canoe. He did it not only because it was his job and he'd, been, and he'd be beaten for failing or refusing, he also did it because he was afraid. He had never been taught how to swim, and if the boat sank, He'd end up like the other boys he'd seen, the ones who descended into the black waters, got trapped in the nets, and never resurfaced. Mark's master had paid Mark's parents the equivalent of about $20 a year for his work, and he was one of five children they had sold into servitude. Two of his siblings worked in the same village. His 11-year-old brother, Kofi, fished with him, and his 9-year-old sister, Hagar, was a domestic servant helping to raise the master's children and clean the fish for the market. The last time Mark saw his mother was the day she had sold him to a man coming to the uh, coming to take him to his to visit his father. Instead, he'd been brought to the village and showed what was now to be his new home for the next several years: a dark six foot six foot square hut with a tiny single window. He would share it with four other boys. Now back to Pam. I slipped the newspaper into my carry-on bag. Randy and I had to get ready to go. We had to gather our things and head downstairs. At breakfast, I could barely eat. Making circles of my yogurt, I could not stop thinking about Mark. He was not much younger than Van and Tata, my two youngest children, and the idea of them having to endure such a life was unthinkable. I asked the others if they knew exactly where Ghana was, but nobody did. Later that evening, Randy and I arrived home and put Van and Tatum to bed. I read the article again. The photographer... Jao Silva had captured something extraordinary. It wasn't the details of Mark's surroundings or his Little Mermaid t-shirt or his bony frame. It was the question in his eyes. They seemed to ask, now that you know about me, what are you going to do? Now, let me tell you about this woman. This was eight years after her son had died. It was seven years after her husband asked her, what do you want to do with this $25,000 that has been donated to Jansen, her son who had died, as a charity offering? Well, here's what had happened in the intervening seven years before she read this article about this boy named Mark. She had, found, she had run in by happenstance to a woman who was Vietnamese, who was in the uh, process of going to Vietnam. She'd met her at an airport by chance. They were waiting for a flight. And she got to talking to her, and the woman said she was going to Vietnam where she was putting children into orphanages. 
because there was a bunch of uh, orphanages there, uh, orphans there that had no parents. They had nowhere to go. They would sit on the streets and sell gum and cigarettes to make money so that they could eat. We're talking about kids as young as three and four years old up to, you know, teenagers. And she got to talking to this woman, made friends with her. They shared a flight. Uh, obviously, Pam was not going to Vietnam, but she was going uh, on the same leg of a flight. They got to talking. And Pam said to the woman, you know, I've got some money that is set aside for a charity, and I would really love to support the work that you're doing in Vietnam. And she thought to herself, I would like to give this woman half of this money. So she asked her, would you be willing to accept a donation of whatever it was, twelve, thirteen thousand dollars $13,000? And the woman said, you know, I would love to have that money because we could do so much good with it. But here's what I would rather have you do. Why don't you take a trip to Vietnam with me? And why don't you take a look at the situation yourself? And then why don't you decide what you want to do? And she, being depressed at the time, still due to the death of her son, she said, fine. She thought it would get her mind off of her depression, and she went to Vietnam, and she was utterly startled, shocked, and amazed at how deplorable the conditions were for these kids. And she saw the work that this woman was doing with the orphanages and rescuing these children and putting them into homes, getting them educations, and she was very deeply touched. She then got involved in rescuing children from Cambodia, very frequently, Vietnamese orphans were stolen from Vietnam, taken to Cambodia, and made to be sex slaves. And so she got involved first with the orphanage project in Vietnam. Then she got involved with the uh, rescuing young girls who were being sold as sex slaves in Cambodia. And during this whole process, she found a meaning in her life. And the meaning was... She was, it, it's kind of like that old starfish story. You throw the starfish into the ocean, and the old man says, hey, you know, the kid says, how is that going to help? There's so many starfish, you can't save them all. And the, the old man says, well, it, it matters to this one. That kind of became her motto. And she ended up adopting two kids. Van and Tatum were adopted, I think one from Cambodia, one from Vietnam. I can't remember. I uh, haven't read that part of the story uh, for a couple of months. And uh, she got into rescuing children that had very significant health issues, bringing them to the United States, getting them medical treatment that they needed. And then after years of doing this, she saw this article, and she saw this boy, and she started doing some research. And she thought surely with all the hundreds of thousands of people that would see this New York Times article, somebody would take the time to look something up and try to find out what to do. And she ran into dead end after dead end, but she's very persistent. She ended up finding the reporter. She ended up taking a trip to Ghana. She ended up finding the man uh, who had helped the reporter find the lake and make the story. And she ended up raising money. She ended up rescuing eight children initially off of the lake, putting them into an orphanage that another man who was a local was building to help these boys. And in the intervening whatever number of years she's rescued something like 200 of these kids off the lake. Now, you might hear that and say, well, so what? And you, I know you're not cynically saying, so what? I mean, it's a touching story. There's no way around that. But you might be saying, so what, from the standpoint of, are you telling me that I need to go rescue children off of a lake in Ghana? And the answer is absolutely not. Here's what the point is. It's probably fairly evident. What is it that you're going to do? What is it? There's got to be something that's worth doing. And if it's doing that, there's a story of Napoleon Hill. His son was born with no ears, and he was deaf. And Napoleon Hill says that he spent time working with this child, this child from the time he was an infant to the time he was in school, helping him to do things like put his teeth on a phonograph machine, the wooden casing of a phonograph machine, so that he could hear through vibrations, and he says that he worked with his son on hearing for an average of four hours a day for years until, guess what happened? A device was invented. This is in the early 1900s, okay? Technology was not the same as it is now. They invented a device that they put into his ears, and he had full hearing. 
had Napoleon Hill done what the doctors had advised when the child was born, which was to put him into an institution, he would have remained, you know, who knows what he would have remained for his whole life. But because Napoleon Hill took this time, see, you, you can try to cure cancer. You can, you can rescue some kids off the lake, or you can just find one kid in your own family that has a need and do something about it. But here's the problem, and here's the first half versus the second half, and here's where it all comes together. If you're spending all your time running around trying to be successful, it's very easy to lose sight of those things that are actually important. Okay? So let me give you some questions that you can ask. This is called the halftime drill. It comes out of the book, Halftime. These are some questions that he wants you to ask, ask yourself, and I think it's a valuable drill. So let me give it to you. Number one, what do you want to be remembered for? Write a description of how your life would look if it turned out just the way you wished. That's pretty tough medicine to swallow right there. Number two, what about money? How much is enough? If I have more than enough, what purpose do I serve with the excess? If I have less than enough, what am I willing to do to correct that? Number three, how am I feeling about my career right now? Is this what I want to be doing with my life 10 years from now? And the implication is, if it's not, you probably ought to shift it to something else. Next, am I living a balanced life? What are the important elements in my life that deserve more time? Number five, what is the primary loyalty in my life? This is a great question. What is the primary loyalty in my life? Now, not to get all scriptural on you, but it does say in the Bible that a man cannot serve two masters because he will love one and hate the other. And in the scriptural context, he's trying to say, I think, what is your real God? Is it God or is it stuff or something or something else? And again, we're not necessarily trying to be Christian on you here or or uh, some sort of biblical context, but I think it's a valuable question because if your if your loyalty lies in your work, then it surely does not lie in your family, let alone anything bigger or better like we've been talking about. Number six, where do I look for inspiration, mentors, and working models for my second half? Number seven, Peter Drucker said that two important needs are self-realization and community. On a scale of one to ten, ten being the highest, how am I doing in these areas? Again, the two areas are self-realization and community. Number eight, draw a line that describes the ups and downs of your life. Or draw three lines, one for personal life, one for family life, and one for work life. Where do they intersect? Where do they diverge? Number nine, which of the following transition options seems to fit your temperament and gifts the best? Evaluate on a scale of one to ten. A, Keeping on doing what I already do well, but change the environment. B, change the work, but stay in the same environment. C, turn an avocation into a new career. D, double track or even triple track parallel careers. Or E, do what I'm doing, even if it's not fulfilling. Number 10, what do I want for my children? Okay, these are just some good questions. You may want to look this part up in the book. And uh, I'm going to show you a video now as we transition into the last part of this call, which is, you know, how to get where you're trying to go. And this is a, it's kind of a silly video. You've probably seen it before. It's uh, on YouTube. And this is called One Thing. And I'm going to share my screen so you can see this here. This is a video from the movie City Slickers with Billy Crystal and Jack Palance. This is a famous scene. There's a pretty good chance you've seen this. But I want to show it to you right now. And Billy Crystal is out on this cattle drive. It's kind of a vacation for stressed out men. And he's on this uh, cattle drive, and he's talking to Curly, who's Jack Balance here on the screen, who is the cowboy. And Curly describes to him the cowboy life and tells him what the secret to success in life is. So let's take a look at this. This is about a minute long. Cowboy leaves a different type of life. Cowboy leaves a life of Thirty-eight. Thirty-nine. Yeah. You all come up here about the same age, same problems. Spend about fifty weeks a 
here, you nuts, and you wrote them in. And then you think two weeks up here will have time for you. None of you get it. Do you know what the secret of life is? No, what? This. Your finger? One thing. Just one thing. You stick to that and everything else don't mean. That's great, but what's the one thing? That's what you've got to figure out. Okay. I love that look at the end when he looks at his finger and he's like, I don't know what the one thing is. And uh, true enough, it's hard to figure out that one thing. Now, here's here's what I want to encourage you to do. A couple things. We're going to wrap up here within about five minutes or so. Okay. So, uh, first of all, let's go back and review. He said, you guys come up here, spend 50 weeks a year getting your knots in, getting knots in your rope. Then you think two weeks up here will untie them. None of you get it. Do you know what the secret of life is? And the secret of life is one thing. Now, here's what I want you to figure out. What is that one thing? That's not for me to decide. I've given you some questions. You can sort of evaluate yourself and your life, but I want you to think about that. What is that one thing? I believe that Curly has told a truism that the secret to life is one thing, and you've got to figure that out. Now, let's just do a quick transition here, and then we'll get you off and on your way. Here's what the transition is. Um, most of you are business owners, and so you find yourself trapped. You find yourself trapped. Now, I'm going to do a, a webinar later this year on the topic called, um, a, it's a book review called The E-Myth Revisited, and it's a book about turning your entrepreneurial business into a business that actually works for you, uh, that serves you instead of you serving it. So uh, that's kind of where I want to go with this. I don't want to cover that topic in detail right now. That is a topic for another day, but uh, I want you to think about getting your business to work for you putting your business in order so that you don't have to be right in the middle of it every single second of every single day. This comes down to being a business owner, not necessarily being the boss. Okay. And I want to go through a section here from the book halftime. It's called practical matters. And uh, I'm just going to make a little bit of commentary on some of these things. What this is, is just some ideas for maybe spooling down a little bit and being able to, um, take a little bit more time so that you can focus on these things we're talking about. So uh, here's just some ideas from the book. I'll make a little bit of commentary. First is delegate at, at home, at work, and in play. Don't try to do everything. You, you've got to get past just doing your job. Number two, do what you do best and get rid of everything else. There, there's this, this old idea that you can, you can work on your weaknesses, and I, I really disagree with that. I think that you should work on your strengths, look at what your strengths are, especially as you look at this second half and this definite chief aim. What are the things that are unique to you? Focus on your strengths. God gave you gifts for a reason. Use them, and don't worry so much about fixing your weaknesses. Now, that doesn't mean that that's an excuse to go around being a jerk, but work on your strengths. Next, no one to say no. People are going to ask you to do things all the time, and a lot of times just not doing things is going to clear your brain and clear your plate. Set limits. If you normally do four appointments a day, cut it back to two or three. If you normally stay an hour after work, go home. If you do 12 business trips a year, cut it back to six. Start to make these changes in your, in your life, okay? Protect your personal time by putting it on your calendar. It's easy enough to put a webinar on a calendar. Why not? personal time, time I'm going to spend with my kids, whatever it is. Number next, work with people that you like. There's not, there's not enough time to work with energy-sucking individuals. Get rid of them. Next, set timetables, things that you're going to do, when you're going to do them, and get after them. Here's the one I like a lot. Downsize. Downsize. Get rid of things that don't add value to your life for real, Okay. Um, think about all the time and energy that are drained by owning a boat, a cottage, a second or third car, a country club membership. None of these things are bad. Some of them provide fun, but they can easily become master controllers. Okay? Consider downsizing. Play around a little bit. Next, build on the islands of health and strength. Build on the islands of health and strength. Con consider your health. Next, work only with people who are receptive to what you're trying to do. You've got a limited amount of time. Working with people that are against you, that don't 
think about this in sales, right? If people aren't interested, move on, okay? Work on only things that will make a great deal of difference if you succeed. Evaluate everything you do every day and look at it and see, is this getting me closer to my definite chief aim or is it just wheel spinning? I'm going to leave you with a quote from George Bernard Shaw that I find to be uh, very interesting, but I have to find it. Uh, where'd that thing go? Okay, here we go. The true joy of life. He described it this way. This is the true joy in life, according to George Bernard Shaw, you, being used for a purpose, recognized by yourself as a mighty one, the being of a force of nature, instead of a feverish, selfish, little clot of ailments and grievances, complaining that the world will not devote itself to making you happy. I am of the opinion that my life belongs to the whole community, and as long as I live, it is my privilege to do for it whatever I can. I want to be thoroughly used up when I die. For the harder I work, the more I live. I rejoice for life in its own sake. Life is no brief candle to me. It is a sort of splendid torch, which I've got to hold, which I've got a hold of for the moment. I want to make it burn as brightly as possible before handing it on to future generations. So this is it. Halftime indefinite chief aim. Hopefully you found some inspiration in this. I found inspiration in just putting this topic together and talking about it. So thanks for participating. Uh, I'm going to be back in uh, 37 minutes for our Insiders Open Forum. We will talk about whatever questions that you have regarding marketing and other business-related topics, and uh, we'll talk to you then. Thanks so much for participating today. Uh, by way of bibliography, if you want to check out some of the books I've talked about, they are, number one, Halftime by Bob Buford, number two, Jansen's Gift by Pam Cope, number three, Law of Success by Napoleon Hill. So check those out. And uh, we'll talk to you next time. Thanks. See you. Bye now.